Today, we're talking about three technologies that you can use to secure your network. And if you're watching this for the CompTIA Security Plus study guide that I'm running on my channel, make sure that you watch all the way until the end. I have something to say at the very end for you. All of that starting right now. A brief admin note right before we start. I wanted to obviously point out the link to the CompTIA Security Plus exam objective study guide. Uh, the link is down in the description. I've included it here in these slides. The first thing that we're going to talk about is firewalls. And I put here that they catch malicious packets in transit, and that's really what they do. So they do that by using access control lists. And this is one of those things that you can get from the vendor themselves that you can build yourselves. There's a number of ways that you can build up your access control list, but that basically tells the firewall what traffic is okay to allow through and what traffic may be malicious. Of course, now we have uh, stateful versus stateless firewalls. Now, what exactly does that mean? A stateful firewall takes the context of the packet and it just makes a determination on if that packet is malicious. And so in order to really understand the depth of that, you know, you might need to understand how like a three-way handshake works. Uh, and, and you know that in certain Nmap scans, the three-way handshake isn't even uh, completed. And that basically allows it to get past a firewall because a firewall may, uh, you know, prevent three-way handshakes for certain devices. It'll take the context of a relationship between two different devices and it will uh, basically prevent any kind of malicious connection. A stateless firewall just inspects the packet in isolation. Does the packet contain any malicious data? Uh, is it coming from a malicious location? And if so, it drops it, but if not, or if it doesn't catch anything, uh, then it may allow the packet through. And of course, we have application and network firewalls. And so the difference really here is, you know, where the firewall lives and, and what it's inspecting. You, you may even have host-based firewalls. Uh, and you may have, you know, just firewalls at different levels of your network. And so it's important to know where the firewall is to know what it may be catching. Of course, have implicit deny commented here. That is, of course, an important rule to have. You, you know, you want to make sure that you are specifying what traffic is clear and what is allowed and what's normal and, and what traffic is not allowed and what is denied. And so with implicit deny, what we're really saying here is basically think of it as like blacklisting pretty much anything that hasn't been whitelisted. So if say some rando wants to connect to your network, it probably will get dropped. Uh, unless it has been whitelisted or unless it's known that it's coming from a known good host. The next tool we want to talk about is VPN concentrators. And I goofed here and said uh, remote work starts here. What that's supposed to say is remote work starts here. So uh, comment down below ORC, just ORK. Uh, and, and that can be a thing now. Thanks to that for me. Uh, but VPN concentrators are basically, we wouldn't be able to do remote work if it weren't for VPN concentrators allowing uh, employees to VPN into or to remotely access internal corporate systems. And so that's kind of where we talk about remote access versus site to site. Now, remote access uh, versus site to site basically is talking about the context in which your VPN concentrators are being used. So for remote access, that's basically the VPN concentrator is open and it's listening for authentication requests from legitimate users uh, from outside in the internet. So say you are you know, working from home, you wanna connect to the VPN on your work, that, that request will be funneled through the VPN concentrator. Now for site to site, that's gonna be a special connection that's set up from one office location to another office location. So members of both locations can access internal resources remotely. And of course, uh, VPN concentrators use IPsec, that's a, uh, newish uh, and more secure form of security for packets in transit. Uh, one of the things to know is tunnel versus is tunnel versus transport mode, and really that is to say that these are two different ways that uh, that IPsec encrypts packets. So in transport port mode, IPsec basically uh, will encrypt the data and then it will encrypt some headers, but uh, the, the, it will use the original IP header to make sure to route the packet through the network. However, in tunnel mode, the whole thing is encrypted. And so the whole thing is encrypted, including the header itself. And of course, the two main elements of IPsec that you wanna keep in mind is your authentication he header and your encapsulation security payload. Um, and basically, the, the header is what's kind of telling the packet where to go. Uh, and of course, it being an authentication header basically shows that it has some integrity. Uh, it, it's 
you know, proving that this packet is legitimate, it's coming from a legitimate source, and it's trying to get to a legitimate destination. And then the, in, in, then the ESP is basically just, you know, the rest of the body of the packet. Uh, there's a trailer involved as well. Uh, we don't need to get crazy in depth unless you want me to uh, put that in the comments. Of course, we have split tunnel versus full tunnel VPNs. Uh, split tunnel basically means that, or let's say you're working uh, in an office environment, right? You're inside of a private network and you need to access resources on another site, on another office location remotely via a VPN, uh, but you also want to access, you know, Facebook or something like that, right? Or that's maybe a bad example. You want to access another website that you don't necessarily need your company's VPN or encryption to access. So in a split tunnel architecture, uh, one tunnel will actually, or your traffic that actually needs to go through the VPN will go through the VPN to the other site, and then whatever doesn't need to be encrypted uh, just goes out and then it comes back in. Uh, and obviously if it's coming back in and it's not encrypted, it'll probably be really inspected by the firewall. So let's say you do try to access Facebook and, and the company has blacklisted Facebook for productivity reasons, uh, then you may not be able to actually get those requests back to you or even sent off to Facebook servers. A full tunnel, however, is everything's encrypted. Everything's part of the VPN. Uh, it's all there. And then of course, VPNs use TLS to make sure that it is secure. It has some confidentiality and integrity. And then of course, we, al we also have always on VPNs. Uh, this basically literally, this literally means it's always on. You can access certain things within a VPN uh, anytime you need. Uh, that obviously will increase its threat profile because it's always on, uh, as opposed to just turning it on when you need it and then turning it back off so you only have access when you need it. And then whenever you do not need access to the resources, it's shut back off. Uh, however, an always on VPN, again, kind of really allows for remote work and a lot of flexibility for employees. And then we got NIDs and NIPs, and what does that even mean? Well, think of it before we talk about it, it's a giant baseball net. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, NIDS means Network Intrusion Detection System, and NIPS means Network Intrusion Prevention System. And these can exist on other levels as well. We're gonna talk about it on a network level. But think of it as a baseball mitt. So you got your firewall uh, up front, and it's gonna be approving and denying packets coming in or out of the network. And whatever makes it pass, uh, like how would you know if a firewall made a false negative and something malicious actually caught, you know, went past the firewall? Well, you would have your NIDs or your NIPs right behind and it would look for indicators of compromise or indicators of some sort of a indicators of compromise and it would be preventing indicators of compromise. So let's say, uh, you know, a malicious packet makes it through, a uh, malicious executable is run, your NIDs or your NIPs, your intrusion prevention system would be able to catch that and the NIDs would be able to detect that and let you know, hey, uh, we just detected that this happened, uh, you know, investigate it. So of course we have two different types of intrusion, of intrusion systems. Uh, we've got signature versus heuristic. And a lot of what you'll see out there is signature based. Uh, that is to say that, you know, certain malware has a unique signature or, you know, some way to identify, okay, this is the kind of malware I'm looking for. And that's exactly how it looks for malware is it's looking off of a unique signature from any given piece of malware. Heuristic is more behavioral. And so that is more coming into form as machine learning advances and AI is taking a, a greater role in security. Uh, it's basically just learning from the environment. What is normal behavior on this environment and what is malicious? And that really is helping to mitigate false positives and false negatives. Of course, it's looking for anomalies. So what is an anomaly? Anomaly is something that uh, is bad, something that doesn't look right, right? And so it will notify, and so it will notify you when it has detected an anomaly. Basically, we got inline and passive, and basically what that means is, you know, is it on the network or is it off the network? And that leads to in-band versus out-of-band. Basically, is you know, is it on the same network as the pack as the packet itself, or is it on a separate network? 
And is it, you know, passively looking at packets, you know, going through the wider network and trying to see if, you know, something malicious is going on. Of course, you can set up all kinds of cool different rules and, and that really ties into the signatures and that really can tie into signatures or specific user patterns. And then of course it will provide a, a level of analytics that you can use to show, you know, here's what was blocked in this period of time, you know, here are different things that we realize can happen if certain malware is run in our environment, etc. And then of course that leads to false positives and false negatives. Now this is always gonna be a thing that exists in any environment, anywhere you go, any kind of data, uh, you know, anytime you're trying to analyze something or any kind of a behavior, you know, everything makes mistakes, even computers. Uh, and so identifying false positives and false negatives is incredibly important. You wanna minimize the false negatives, obviously, but you also wanna minimize the false positives. You really wanna find true positives and true negatives. And so, you know, let's break that down real quick. If you don't know, a false positive is something that was identified and flagged as malicious whenever it's actually innocent and normal and okay. And then a false negative is something that was allowed, uh, basically thought to be something that could be trustworthy or allowed to pass. Uh, however, it was malicious. And so uh, an attacker is always trying to be identified as a false negative. Uh, if they if they can get if they have to be identified in any way shape or form right uh, and so you want to make sure that you're finding true positives and true negatives so those are the three tools that you can use to secure your network if you're following along for the CompTIA security plus city guide catch this next video covering five tools you can use to build your network and comment down below with something that you learned and there's a chance that I might shite that I'm out and there's a chance that I might shout you out in the comment section. With that, I'll see you next time.